to follow on from the discussion just before uh, coffee break, um, we were talking about the, the possibility, the likelihood of being able to use point of care tests for antimicrobial resistance. And I think in the future, um, real antimicrobial stewardship has got to mean um, using the right antimicrobial that immediately for the right um, organism uh, at the right time. Um, but using point of care tests um, means that you have to implicitly understand the molecular basis, the sequence basis of the drug resistance. You have to ident un identify the genotype that underlies that resistance phenotype. Now resistance in bacteria is complex um, and it can be acquired through a number of different mechanisms. You can acquire an obvious resistance gene on a plasmid, on the chromosome, on a transposon. They're very easy to spot, they're very easy to test for. Um, or you can have uh, mutations in core genes. We heard before about uh, fluoroquinolone resistance, uh, mutations in gyra. Very, very few known mutations. Again, very easy to test for. Um, but there are many, many more um, resistance mechanisms that are many, much more subtle, um, and we don't understand the molecular basis for many of those. Um, Many of them will be down to point mutations, and those point mutations can be acquired uh, either by de novo point mutation in, in response to the antibiotic, or by homologous recombination. That is, bringing in that gene, that sequence, um, uh, as uh, as part of a block of, of DNA, uh, and recombining it from a, a donor organism into a into a recipient organism. So, as I say, accurate precision of resistance is going to require accurate knowledge of the cause of variance. So, I was going to I was asked to talk about. Um, multidisciplinary research and how um, we can bring the expertise of many disciplines. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you is a, is a, a kind of circular talk that will start um, at the very clinical end and go through some um, basic molecular biology and, and, and genetics and genomics and then come full circle back to the clinic at the end. So we're going to start um, here. Um, this is Mela refugee camp. Um, it's on the Thai-Burmese border. This is Thailand here, and this is Burma at the top. This is a, a refugee camp that's housed a population of, uh, of Burmese refugees for probably 40 years or so. There's 50,000 people live in this camp in an area of two and a half square kilometers. Um, they don't move uh, very much out of the camp. They're not allowed outside of the camp. So a very fixed population, very dense population has been there for a long time. So our collaborators um, were concerned about um, particularly Streptococcus pneumoniae in this camp. There's a high carriage rate of strep pneumoniae and high rate of disease. So uh, the collaborators, Paul and Claudia Turner, who work at the um, Work on Trust Overseas Unit in Thailand, went um, to investigate uh, the um, strep pneumo in the camp. They set up a clinic there to, to treat uh, and, and help the uh, the people in the camp, but also to study strep pneumo. And they set up a longitudinal carriage study. And what they did was they recruited 1,000 infants, which was pretty much the whole birth cohort in that camp. Um, they sampled them at birth, nasopharyngeal sampling, and every month, every, every month for two years. Um, and they collected around 6,000 isolates of streptococcus pneumoniae. So this is a phenomenal data set. It's, an, it's a very, very dense sampling, probably saturation sampling of streptococcus pneumoniae in uh, infants in a very, very um, enclosed environment. And it should tell us an awful lot about the underlying biology of strep pneumo and the underlying genetics, which is why we decided to um, get involved and to sequence these um, genomes. Now, um, we sequenced 3,000 genomes from this. Now, I keep expecting people to go, ooh. No. <laughs> when I started sequencing genomes at the Sanger Institute, it took 18 months and half a million pounds to sequence one genome, and we had to spend at least a year talking to the Wellcome Trust about how important this individual genome was to get the money to do that. So being able to do one experiment with 3,000 genomes is a phenomenal change over just 10 or 15 years. Anyway, we sequenced 3,000 genomes, um, and we did what we always do, which is to build a tree. Um, and that's the any time that you try to understand large, large numbers of bacterial genomes, you have to understand the phylogeny. You have to understand the relationships of the organisms, the relationships of the genomes, and that means building a tree. So this is the tree. This is the tree around the outside of this, um, this circle here. Now, the first thing uh, which was quite interesting is this tree represents, uh, not absolutely, but to a first approximation, most of the global diversity of Streptococcus pneumoniae. 
um, which is quite amazing. There's this completely isolated refugee camp in the middle of nowhere, and yet most of the uh, diversity of strep pneumo that you would see around the world is there. And that's probably because it's or, or it was already there when the camp was populated, but also a testament to how rapidly organisms like strep pneumo move around the world. They can move across the globe in years or less. Um, so any particular location will have its own idiosyncrasies about the population, but it will have a good sampling of the whole of the global population. Now what you can see is there's quite a lot of diversity represented by these long branches around here, um, but there are some very tight clusters. Now we want to do some, some very um, detailed genetic analysis, and we can only do that detailed genetic analysis where the organisms are very closely related. So some of our analysis is based on these very tight clusters. Uh, we've identified them using a program called BAPS, and they're coloured in um, red in, 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 in shading here. Yeah. The other thing you can see are these red clusters, these red tips. So the red are non-typable strains. Now, Streptococcus pneumoniae has a, has a capsule, a polysaccharide capsule on its surface. It can have 90 different capsules. Now, any one member of the species, any one strain, will have one capsule type, but the species as a whole has 90 different types, and they can be swapped around by recombination. And in most cases, these individual groups have a single capsule, and this is the capsule determinant, 90F, 23F, etc. The red ones are non-typable, they don't have a capsule. You can see this cluster down here, mainly non-capsulate, and this diverse cluster up here is non-capsulate. So that's the population structure. So we can ask some simple questions, about, particularly about these large clusters. We can say, is the mutation rate any different between the clusters? And we can measure that, and we can see, no, the mutation rate is pretty much constant in any part of the tree. Um, the other key determinant of diversity is recombination. In strep pneumo, it's a very recombinant organism. It's, it's naturally uh, competent. It freely takes up DNA from the environment. And that's a key part of its genetics. So we want to know, does that frequency of recombination differ between clusters? Um, and actually, it does. Most of the clusters have similar rates of recombination. But this cluster over here recombines at a much higher frequency. And this is the non-typical cluster. So it's not got a capsule. So the question is, is it more re recombining more frequently because it doesn't have a, cluster, a capsule? And we can split this cluster down into... into um, it, there are some in there that have a capsule. It's a, it's a um, 14... What's it? 14... Serious like 14 capsule. So we can see um, that these that have a capsule have a much lower recombination frequency than the ones that don't. So we know that... Um, that recombination is much more frequent. We can see that recombination is much more frequent in certain subsets of the population, the non-capsular non ones. So let's go back to our, our tree. Um, we can do our fine-scale analysis within these highly related clusters, and one of the things that allows us to do is identify recombination, where recombination has come into that genome. Um, and each of these ticks, these, these arcs, when they're close to this edge, that's a recombination event that's come into one of these clusters. Now, because we've got saturation sampling of our location, we can identify where that recombination has come from. Generally, if you take one strep pneumo genome or any genome, you could see where this recombination come in, you can recognize it in the genome, but no idea where it's come from because it could have come from anywhere. But because we know pretty much the whole population of strep pneumo in this one location, we can be pretty good sure that we know where the uh, origin of the recombination is. And that's the um, the second the end of the arc, where it's further away from the circle, these are the donors. And what you can see is that if you look at the donors, the donors uh, are more frequently coming from the non typables And actually, there's a positive correlation between the probability of being a donor and the size of a cluster and the diversity of the cluster. And these non typable clusters are large and diverse. So that means that our non typable strains are more frequent acceptors of recombination and more frequent donors of recombination. They're acting as hubs. Re DNA is coming in and out of these non typable clusters. And that will become important. I'll show you later. So one of the things, the second thing we can do is to look at recombination and how it's spread across the genome. So I'm going to step away from this data set for a, a second and look at another data set we published a little while ago, again strep pneumo, but this time a single serotype, 23F, and not from a single location, but from a global collection. And these are from all over the world. And this is the genome of Streptomimo across here. These are all the genes and colours. And these represent the recombination events that we've 
placed on this tree. So we can see where all the recombination events have happened on this tree. And the red ones are on internal branches and the blue ones are on external <coughs> branches. And what that allows us to see is whether any regions of the genome are more or less likely to recombine. And you can see this heat map across the top in blue and red. The red regions are more likely to recombine or more likely to have seen recombination. Now, we know the mechanism of recombination in strep pneumo. We know there is no sequence specificity to it. So if there is a difference in the apparent frequency of recombination, it must be because something else has happened, and that something else is selection. So what happens is lots of the genome recombines all the time, but recombination events that are beneficial are selected. Um, and what we can see sitting under these hot spots, in this case of this globally dispersed strain, are surface proteins. Uh, here, here, and here, and the capsule buckets, and a region over here that's to do with drug resistance. But most of this is surface proteins and surface structures, and that tells us that the the predominant selective pressure that's acting on this large strain, that, that this large clone that's spread globally, is diversifying selection from the human immune system. So let's go back uh, to our strep pneumo data set from Maylar and say, where is the most frequent recombination in the data sets in Maylar? Um, and the first thing that strikes us is we look at each of these clusters individually. So these are completely different parts of strep, different types of strep pneumo. They all just happen to be in the same camp. And you can see these peaks of recombination frequency are the same. That means that the selective pressure that's acting on these strep pneumos is the same across the whole camp, irrespective of the strep pneumo you're looking at. Um, and what's sitting underneath these peaks are all genes that are involved in drug resistance. So it's telling us that what we're looking at here is the short-term selective pressure of antibiotic use in the camp, whereas before we were looking at the longer-term selective pressure of diversifying populations, of diversi diversifying selection from the immune system. <coughs> so I'm sure you're all asking what has this got to do with what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> I hope it's interesting, but, but it is relevant. Um, so if we look at beta-lactam resistance, for example, we can look at the phylogeny, the individual structures, the genes that carry beta-lactam resistance. So in this case, it's these penicillin binding proteins. And we know um, that beta-lactam resistance in Streptococcus pneumoniae is caused by, um, on the whole, what are called in the, in, the, in the literature mosaic genes, that is, recombinations, that there's a, a PVP from a sensitive strain will recombine with a PVP from a resistant strain, and the whole block of DNA will come over that carries somewhere in it the actual resistance mutations. But all you see is this block of recombination, which is why the term mosaic genes. So if we look at, let's say, PVP2B, so this is the tree of the PVP2B genes in all of those 3,000 strains. On the outer circle is whether those genes are conferring resistance in black or sensitivity in white. And you can see the structure of the tree is very different. For the sensitive strains, it's mainly flat, and for the resistant strains, it's very, very, the branches are very long. This is a signature of recombination. And what it's showing is that Strains that have undergone recombination are more likely to be resistant. And we can do some tests and some statistics, and we can see that indeed, across the PPP genes, genes that have undergone recombination are more likely to be resistant. And that means the effect of recombination is to bring in resistance. Well, that's not a, a huge surprise. So let's try it on uh, another set of genes. And these are genes involved in resistance to cotroxazole, folate biosynthesis genes. Now, if we look around the outside, we can see sensitivity and resistance uh, spread much more evenly around the tree. Uh, and um, not looking at this one, because it's better, <laughs> you can see not, not a huge amount of difference in the structure of the tree, whether they're sensitive or resistant. And when we do the analysis, we find that there's actually no relationship now between recombination of these folate genes and resistance, which is odd, because we know that they're the genes that are responsible for resistance. Now, because um, our collaborators are working in this camp long term, they know the that the pattern of antibiotic usage in the camp. And they know that beta-lactam resistance has been increasing, cotamoroxazole usage has been decreasing. So let's go back to the data set, we go back to the data set and we look at our recombinations again and we split them into recombinations that have happened very recently and recombinations that happened um, further up, further ago, uh, longer ago. 
And we can see from where they are on the tree about when they happened. And what we see is that isolates that have undergone recent recombination are less resistant than isolates with older recombination events. So the effect of recombination in this case is to bring sensitive alleles back into the population, and that sort of ties into what we were talking about before about um, whether um, resistance will go away again. In this case, cotrimoxazole, sensitive isolate strain, sensitive mutations, sensitive uh, mutations that confer sensitivity being brought back into the population, <coughs> mutations that confer resistance are going out. So the highly recombined genes are those associated with antibiotic resistance, and when we look in detail under those, we see the temporal trend of genetic exchange is consistent with the selection pressure. So we got quite excited by this data set um, for many reasons. Um, but one, because we thought it gave us an opportunity to do something that nobody's really tried in bacteria before, which is genome-wide association studies. Um, so traditionally, genome-wide association studies, that the kind that have been used in human genetics to such great effect over the last decade or more, have been very difficult in bacteria. And that's partly because limited recombination of bacteria, because they have a clonal population structure, and because on the whole we've only had very small sample sizes. So I said before that beta-lactam resistance is generally described in the literature as being due to mosaic genes, uh, and that means that you can't separate out the real cause to variance from the recombination block they're sitting in. So we reasoned that, that the rate of recombination in these genes uh, might be sufficient to allow us to identify the cause to variance. Because every recombination event, the problem with association studies is you can try and associate your variant with a phenotype, but if your variant is linked to a lot of other SNPs, then you can't separate them out. You can't say which is bit positive. But the more recombination events you have, the more you separate out the causative variants from the non-causative ones. And we thought we might have enough recombination to allow us to try that. So we did our primary analysis with our 3,000 main isolates. We replicated it with 600 isolates from a similar data set in Massachusetts. And we did some actually fairly simple um, association statistics. I say they're fairly simple. I don't understand them. We stopped at this. A PhD student did this work. Um, we did a, a fairly simple association statistic and we, and we conditioned that association statistic on the population clusters to try and remove some of the effect of population structure. Um, and this is the plot we've got. So you'll all have seen Manhattan plots for human genetics, I'm sure. Um, basically, this is the, all the SNPs across in the, the genome, and this is the statistic of strength of association between each of those SNPs and our phenotype, which in this case is beta lactam resistance. And you can see very, very clear peaks of association. And this is the first time we'd ever seen a Manhattan plot in a bacteria. We're very excited by it. Um, and the first test you need to do is to make sure that it, that, 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 it, that it really is association with the phenotype. So if you randomize the phenotypes and do the test again, no signal. So it's, it's a good, strong signal. So what's sitting under these peaks? Well, what's sitting under those top three peaks is the PVP genes, where we know the resistance is. So that's good. What's sitting under, there's two other secondary peaks, you can see there's a lot of peaks here, but lots of interesting things under them. Two other peaks that are coming up quite high, this dotted line is the level of genome-wide significance. And what's sitting under those two peaks are folate genes. Now those are to do with, uh, with cotrimoxazole resistance. And now cotrimoxazole resistance has no mechanistic, mechanistic overlap with beta-lactam resistance at all. So why when we test for beta-lactam resistance do we see association with uh, cotrimoxazole resistance, and it's simply actually because um, they are the phenotypes are associated. If a bacterium is resistant to, in, in this data set, if a bacterium is resistant to beta-lactams, it's just much more likely to also be resistant to, to cotrimoxazole, because both cat antibiotics have been used. Um, so through that phenotype association, you get a genetic association as well. <coughs> which is just to say the data is, um, the data is, is, is a little noisy. Um, if we do the same analysis on the Massachusetts data set, we see actually the same three primary peaks. We see a lot more noise uh, and a lot more broad peaks. And that's the effect that I was talking about earlier, that the less recombination you capture, the, the less able you are to associate individual uh, mutants with resistance. Uh, and you can see that effect here. Um, and we did some tests on that and showed that the... the, the the linkage size, the, the size of a piece of DNA that's physically linked or genetically linked, is smaller in the Mailer data set than the Massachusetts data set. So in Mailer, uh, with the larger sample size, you have a much more, a greater ability to nail down to identify those individual variants that are causing resistance. 
So how well do we actually do? So we took to be our most rigorous data set was um, the SNPs that we found independently in Mailer and Massachusetts. You can see we found more associations in Massachusetts because uh, although it's a smaller sample size, it's got less resolution. So we see more associations, more of which will be false positives. Some of the Mailer ones will be false positives and we reasoned that the ones we saw independently in both would have the best chance to be true positives. Uh, so let's go and have a look at those 300 odd SNPs. Um, what this is plotting those SNPs again, and it's plotting them uh, as to whether they're synonymous or non-synonymous, and we can see that many of these um, SNPs sitting under these peaks are non-synonymous, that is they're changing the amino acid sequence of the protein. If we go and look at where they are, we can see these are all the genes involved in um, cell wall biosynthesis, which is the target of beta-lactams, and we can see it sits under again these PVP genes, but also in some of the other genes in cell wall biosynthesis. And if we zoom in on three of these genes, the PVP genes, we can see the associated SNPs in red from both isolates, from both data sets, are sitting within the active domains um, in grey and close to the active sites in dotted lines. So we think that actually we may be getting down to what are the actual causative variants. And we can test that if we look at PVP1A. These are the SNPs we found associated with resistance. We can go and look in the literature and say how many of these have been associated with resistance in the literature. Um, uh, this is a poor man's validation. The proper validation would be go and test all these SNPs, which we will get around to doing, honest. Um, for the moment, we can see whether anyone else has done that. And we can see quite clearly that about 40% of the SNPs we identify have been shown in the literature to be involved in drug resistance. So this one here next to the active site, uh, and this one here with a, a mechanism of resistance. So we believe we're getting a cause to variance, and even more excitingly, um, we can actually see variants that have differential responses to different antibiotics, different beta-lactams. So this is a, all of the SNPs that are associated with beta-lactam resistance. This is their strength of association with penicillin resistance and this with ketoaxone resistance. And you can see that most give resistance to both. Some are associated with resistance to one only. And if we take this high scoring hit up here, um, it's been shown to give resistance to um, the ketoaxones and not the penicillins. So, we think that we're identifying causative SNPs, um, and this is where uh, the human geneticists start to get really annoyed with this, because if you look at human genetic association studies, they find variants. They haven't got a clue whether they're actually causing what they're... Uh, and they spend an awful lot of time trying to chase down whether the causative variants or whether they're just linked to the causative variants. We think we found the causative variants. We can test that by taking the SNPs we've identified, going back to our data set and trying to say how much of that phenotypic resistance can we explain with the SNPs that we've identified. And that's what these graphs are showing, first in the Mailer and the then the Massachusetts data set, for every single SNP, every combination of all pairs of SNPs, triplets, etc. We can see that um, after we've got taken into account what maybe 9, 10, 11 SNPs, we're explaining nearly 90 to 100% of the resistance in the population. So we really are being able, using these approaches, to identify those cause to variants, those cause to variants we're going to be able to go and use in point of care tests in the longer term. Um, so where are these resistant SNPs in the population? Um, they are, uh, each of these um, rows is one of, uh, one, of these, um, one of these clusters in the population. The, the blue bar box is one of these resistant SNPs. Now, one of the reasons um, that uh, specific surface polysaccharides were chosen as vaccine uh, candidates for strep pneumo is because there was an association between cer certain resistances, or resistances in the population and certain serotypes. Um, and there was the hope that vaccination would drive resistance out of the population of strep pneumo. Uh, these are the vaccine types over here in Mailer and in Massachusetts. And you can see, actually, compared to the non-vaccine types, um, they do have uh, predominance of these drug resistance <coughs> gene markers. But over here, these are our non typables we started talking about in the first place. They don't have a capsule, therefore they're completely recalcitrant to vaccination um, using the uh, surface capsule conjugates. Um, and they have a huge number of these drug resistance mutations. So these strains over here, which we found at the beginning, were acting as a hub of recombination and moving genes around between different strains are actually carrying most of the drug resistance alleles as well, which is a worrying thing. So, can we use this approach in other organisms? 
Um, I said it works in strep pneumo because strep pneumo recombines very freely. Uh, many organisms don't recombine as well. Staph aureus doesn't recombine uh, very much. Um, we can still use this using large enough data sets. Um, so this is uh, a single uh, gene in Staph aureus that we know is associated with fusidic acid resistance. Um, we tried to do an association study, not genome-wide, but within the gene to identify new variants associated with fusidic acid resistance. Um, we tested 1,700 isolates. This is from a collaboration with Sharon Peacock at Edinburgh's. Um, and we can see uh, that the um, green tips are known fusidic acid resistance mutations, which we recover, and there are some red ones here, which are significantly associated with fusidic acid resistance, uh, but which were previously unknown in the literature. So even in organisms that don't recombine very much, we can start to do this. Um, can we do this in organisms that don't recombine at all? Um, well, not using exactly the same approach, but we can use something different. Um, and that's a, a technique called homoplasy. So homoplasy simply means finding the same character in two different parts on the tree that can't be explained by the structure of the tree. Um, so if we build a tree of, of TB, this is um, a set of uh, a few hundred strains from, a hundred or so strains from um, Russia. That's a collaboration with Francis Jobniewski. Um, this is the tree. Um, it's a very robust tree because there's no recombination at all in mycobacterium tuberculosis. It simply does not recombine. Um, if we look at the drug resistance, we can see the drug resistance here arising independently pretty much on the tips of the tree. And all of that is by de novo point mutation. So what we want to do is take the tree um, and say which SNPs don't fit the tree. Um, because any, any SNP that's occurring, um, it, we, we get an underlying sort of clock-like accumulation of SNPs and that's what gives us this tree structure, uh, the underlying phylogeny. Um, if drug resistance is occurring independently on the different tips, there must be de novo acquisition of point mutations that's occurring on those tips as well. And if it's the same mutation, to give the same resistance, you'll see that. Um, identical mutations occurring independently, which you wouldn't see in the absence of selection. Do we see that? We do. Here's those 42 um, strain isolates. We see just 18 homoplasic SNPs. There's several thousand SNPs that build the tree, 18 of those SNPs don't fit the tree. They're all drug-resistant SNPs. All by one, actually, um, which is a compensatory mutation. So if we take that and expand it out, um, here's a data set of 1,000 genomes from Russia, again, in association with Francis. Um, this is the tree down the left-hand side, um, which is pretty, pretty um, condensed with 1,000 genomes in there. Each of these is um, a gene involved in drug resistance. Each of the colored bars is one SNP that's associated with drug resistance in that gene that we've identified because the SNP is occurring independently on different branches of the tree. Um, these are the RNA polymerase genes. This is the, sorry, this is the rifampicin resistance determining region. These are the SNPs that give rifampicin resistance. All of these other ticks are independent mutations that are occurring uh, on different branches of the tree, those are all compensatory mutations. They're compensating for the fitness effects of the rifampicin resistance mutations. Um, so our, our approach will identify the resistance mutations themselves, but also SNPs that are associated with resistance, but not necessarily causative. So how well can we go back and predict resistance with the, with the strains with those SNPs that we find? Um, this is, uh, quite a lot of numbers on this slide, but if you look down the right-hand side at the uh, sensitivity and specificity, you can see for, for many genes, rifampicin, for example, we can be extremely sensitive and specific if we try and predict with, with the genes we've got. But for many other cases, the sensitivity and specificity is very low, far too low to use in a, um, a, a point-of-care test. Um, so um, Derek Crook's group, we heard um, mentioned earlier, uh, in Oxford have been doing a lot of analysis of mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, particularly working with Public Health England, um, trying to implement whole genome sequencing of um, TB um, within the PHE. Um, firstly, initially for, for um, tracking of um, transmission chains, but ideally also for a drug resistance prediction, because phenotypic resistance prediction in TB takes weeks or months to grow the organism and test it. 
we can do it from the DNA, we can do it very, very rapidly in, in, in days. And that does change how the, the physician would prescribe. Um, so uh, the Oxford group have taken a different approach. This is from a paper in the Lancet Infectious Diseases that came out this week. Um, and what they've done is um, taken a set of genes where they know resistance occurs and try to look for every mutation in those genes and say, is this muta mutation associated with resistance? Or do we only ever find this mutation in sensitive strains? And therefore try and discriminate between <coughs> resistance and sensitive strains. Now, this is the, the SNPs that they find in these um, chosen genes. They're not trying to look genome-wide. They're looking at individual genes. Um, and what you find is that for certain of these mutations, and actually these red ones are mutations that are already used in point of care tests, we find them quite frequently in sensitive strains in red as well as in resistant strains in blue. So there's a, a bit of work to be done there. Um, how well do we do with prediction in other organisms? Um, this is a test set we did on Staphylococcus aureus. Um, this is the uh, data sets from the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, a UK-wide data set, an East of England collection um, of Anbrook's MRSAs. Um, what we can see is our false negative and false positives over here are actually um, pretty good. For, for, a, for, a, for a direct test. This is direct prediction from the genome sequence of, of all of these resistances. Um, and if we go and look um, at some of these, so for example, in the BSAC collection, the false negatives uh, seem to be quite high. So for fusidic acid, our initial sensitivity is 0.75. If we retest some resistance, uh, incorrectly predicted resistant ones, um, they retest as sensitive. Um, for mupiracin, our sensitive appeared to be low, but when we retested some, Intermediate phenotypes, they're retested as sensitive. And similarly with fluoroquinolones and tetracycline. So what this is actually telling us, and in many cases, our resistance prediction from the genotype is more accurate than the phenotypic testing that's currently used. But it's difficult to know what your sensitivity and specificity actually is when the gold standard is less accurate than the test you're trying to introduce. Um, uh, so can we do this with other organisms? Again, this is data from the Oxford group, from Derek Crook's group, looking at E. coli and Clebsiella pneumoniae sensitivity and specificity, and you can see um, sensitivities and specificities extremely high. Um, antibiotics overall 0.96, the specificity of 0.97. So um, certainly uh, with error rates well within limits set by the FDA for the phenotypic testing. So even now, with the data that we have at the moment, we can probably be more accurate uh, for E. coli and Clebsiella pneumoniae and Staph aureus in predicting resistance threat from uh, tests. Um, and this is a, a final data set from Klebsiella pneumoniae from that same uh, publication from Derek Cook's group again with a specificity of 0.97. Um, and in this case, an error rate slightly outside the FDA. So how do we go about implementing this? So in, um, in the paper that uh, it's, uh, just come out from the, from the, from the um, Oxford group, um, on TB, they've come up with a, an algorithm that they can use to start implementing this testing um, on their TB strains as they're generated in, in, in East of England, in the um, PHE pilot that's undergoing at the moment. Um, so basically taking a drug resistance, uh, taking a, a, a genome sequence, um, and what they've done, as I said before, is they've um, looked at every mutation that they find in a very large data set, um, and said, for each mutation, is it associated with resistance? Is it always found in resistance? Is it always found in sensitive strain? Is it a resistance SNP? Yes, reported resistant. Um, are all the mutations known to be benign, or are there no mutations reported as susceptible? In neither of those cases, i.e. if it's got SNPs you don't know anything about, and you don't report on it, and you go down the route of doing a standard phenotypic test. And then you can feed that back in later. Um, Taking these two, then there's a further test um, looking at um, the confidence intervals of prediction. Uh, and if the confidence intervals of prediction are too wide, they will repeatedly confirm the phenotype until the confidence intervals of prediction come between a reasonable limit. And at that point, you stop doing phenotyping. Um, so this process um, will eventually catalogue all the variants you ever find in TB, hopefully, uh, um, and, and enable you to do fully uh, to, to stop phenotyping. Um, now, I'm not sure that that's ever going to be um, uh, 
that, that may work with TB, where all of the mutations arise de novo. We know that we can get completely novel resistance mutations arising. We get completely novel resistance genes coming into the population, and we need to be able to test for that. So I think um, a structure that I think we should put in place um, uh, has a, two aspects. So there's a central aspect. Um, we have to do a, a large amount of resistance market discovery. This is what we're doing. This is what researchers are doing around the world. Um, we need to build a curated databases of validated resistance markers that can be used in point-of-care tests. I think this is the role of a central health service. I think it's the role of PHE. I'd like PHE to think that it's the role of PHE. We can work on that. Um, and what that means is that um, as you do sequencing locally, um, either using a direct test, so taking DNA out of the patient, um, or, or some other PCR-type test, um, you can validate these or, or compare the results of this test to your curated database and generate a resistance report. You can also uh, isolate the bacterium, which is done routinely anyway, sequence the a bacterium and generate a resistance report. Now, most point-of-care testing is moving down this route to PCR testing and to DNA testing. I think that's a danger. I think that's a real issue. I think we need to continue going down this route of isolating bacteria. Um, firstly, because um, well, it, it allows us to use this route. But secondly, we can continue to do phenotypic testing on a subset of strains. And that allows us to check every now and then that there aren't anomalies, that we're not predicting something that's sensitive when in fact it's resistant. Uh, because we can only predict what we know. Um, and the novelty will fall out. So we need to do, we need to keep doing phenotypic phenotypic testing. We need to keep occasionally checking for anomalies. And then we can identify novel markers, we can validate them. And we can send them back into our curated database. Um, now, I've done this as a central and local, but what's absolutely key is that we have feedback and that all of the local data is reported back to the centre and to allow us to do um, proper surveillance. So this link this mandatory reporting, well, I think it should be mandatory reporting to sequence data from the clinic back to the central health uh, laboratories, I think is absolutely key for accurate surveillance. So um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, I should say that that strep pneumonia data set I spoke about before was a, a big collaboration um, with the Mahadol Oxford Research Unit in Thailand, a number of other groups around the UK. Most of this work that I've talked about is collaboration with Sharon Peacock's group at Addenbrooke's. I also showed some data from Derek Crook's group in Oxford. Uh, and that strep pneumonia data set was, was um, analysed by a PhD student. I want you to think about one PhD student with 3,000 genomes as a PhD <laughs> project. Um, but she did get a PhD just recently. <laughs>